and welcome to episode 22 of the Breaking Bio podcast. Today is March the 15th, the Ides of March, here in the future. And uh, we've got a full house today, so I'm going to jump right into the introductions, uh, starting with Bug. Hi, I'm Bug Girl, transmitting from my secret lair in Connecticut. I'm Heidi Smith, I'm a postdoc at University of Texas at Austin. Hi, I'm Morgan Jackson, I'm a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Hi, I'm Rafael Maya, PhD student in Akron, Ohio. Hi, I'm Tom Housley, I'm a PhD student at the University of Stirling in Scotland. And since I will not admit that I made an error, I'm going to pretend that I meant to introduce myself last. I'm Stephen Hamblin, postdoc at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And uh, so we're joined by a special guest today, and we have uh, John Hutchinson with us. John? Hello. I, you know, just looking at your, uh, your pages and your work, you do some really cool stuff. And you're into biomechanics and dinosaurs. Sure, yeah, dinosaurs and, and almost anything with legs and bones that moves on land. You did tigers the other day, right? Yeah, yeah, so we've, we've been working uh, a bit on cats and cats of different sizes because uh, they do some weird things, uh, small versus large cats. Sorry, just to set the stage for us, can you tell us about biomechanics and, and you know, for the readers at home? Biomechanics is kind of a, a sister field to biophysics, but it's actually quite different. It's, it's the Newtonian mechanics of movement in organisms, and uh, I like to see it as the physics of morphology, the way that animals work in a, in a physical sense, so using the laws of physics to understand the way that animals work, uh, anatomically especially. So how their how their how their movement relates to the underlying form and the physics of life on Earth. So I thought it was really interesting. I was looking on your website and your work, and a lot of the work in biomechanics is to understand like how things work and how they work optimally, right? How they function mm -hmm. to to get the best job done as possible. And I found it really cool that you list as one of your research interests suboptimal designs, right? And you. It's, I think you call it dumb design, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I love this stuff. I mean, I'm a big fan of the Gould and Lewinton famous 1979 paper on spandrels and the uh, kind of anti-adaptationist uh, screed. Uh, I really like that paper because it's so anti-authority and so uh, provocative, <laughs> even though it's way over the top and, and a bit wrong at times. But, but I think biomechanics in particular makes the mistake a lot of overemphasizing optimization. Like, it's assumed that everything is optimal. It's, it's quite Panglossian uh, to go, to, to take a word from Voltaire and from Gould and Lewinton. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I don't just study how animals work in a static, ahistorical sense. I'm really interested in how the way animals work evolves. To me, that is, that's the holy grail to try to understand how function evolves, how behavior evolves as well. So I want to understand all the way from the morphological level up through function and into performance and behavior, things like that. That's, that's the spectrum I'm kind of working in, which is pretty broad and scary. So give us an example of, of how this might work, you know, like uh, starting start to finish, like an animal that you're working on. I think, I think my favorite example is actually from my PhD back, uh, when did I finish, 2001. I, I spent about six years, well, yeah, six years of my PhD dissecting animals and, and, and trying to figure out how muscle scars and other indicators of, of muscle attachments on limb bones uh, in living animals related to what you see in fossils and then use that information to reconstruct the leg musculature in a thing like a T-Rex, a, a Tyrannosaurus. And so I spent years doing that really painstaking anatomy, um, some pretty long and, and maybe tedious papers, depending on your point of view. But that was all to understand the anatomy and then be able to represent the anatomy in computer models, which is what I've been doing kind of since, to understand how that anatomy would have functioned in a, in a real organism. And so that, that's kind of a big approach I use, is, re is, is figure out anatomy and then 
use that to reconstruct function either in computer models, kind of a reverse engineering function, or in living animals, actually measuring the function, and then from what we know about anatomy, figuring out how they did it, how they did something that we actually measured them do. Yeah, I did a, I did a workshop with Stephen Rowe. I don't know if you know him. Oh, yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, we, we, did, we did 3D reconstructions from CT scan data and then did finite anal uh, element analysis on, like, byte strength and things like that. And it was, I mean, has absolutely no relevance to my research, but it was one of the coolest things I've ever done. Yeah, his, his group is definitely world-leading. He does, he does the front end of the animal, which I just find too complicated. <laughs> and I, I do everything behind, behind that, which is, which is easier. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to do the back end. I think that's where it's at. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You like big animal butts and you cannot lie? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. It's interesting. So someone, so I'm really interested in amphibians, obviously, mm -hmm. and uh, someone had made a, like a robo salamander, which is something that goes in water but also in land. Have you done um, anything in both land and water for the dinosaurs? Well, dinosaurs, uh, by and large, were not aquatic at all, as far as we know, except once you get into their descendants, birds, which, of course, there are plenty of incidences of aqu aquatic uh, specialization in, in birds. But in dinosaurs, none of them really look like good swimmers. And there's no doubt that they could swim to some degree. And that would be a really stupid to be a globally widespread group that's around for 160 so million years, and none of them can swim. Uh, but uh, they weren't very good at it, as far as we can tell. Um, but I have worked on early tetrapods, the first four-legged animals to come onto land. And that's a big focus of my research now, is kind of doing what we've done with dinosaurs, but with these guys, which hardly anyone has done any sort of biomechanics with. It's all just kind of rubbing bones together and saying, ah, I think it moved that way, and that's the end of it. Uh, so we're trying to bring a bit more rigor to this and actually work on living animals and figure out, well, how does a salamander move? And what does that tell us about how an early tetrapod like Ichthyostega might have moved, for example? I think so, it's really interesting when you consider, sorry, lizards versus salamanders. Because a lot of people talk mm -hmm. about, you know, that salamanders have so many more physiological constraints because they have to be able to have both of these sort of stages in their lives. Yeah, many of them. I mean, yeah, they're, they're direct developing ones, and that's what I'm hoping to work with, is look at the, the ones that don't have a larval metamorphosis that just go from, from, from salamandry larvae to salamanders walking around on land. Uh, those haven't been as studied as much in, the ter in terms of locomotion. A lot of the studies have been on these metamorphosizing kind of standard salamanders. So I'm excited to get to that. When you're, you know, sitting at a party and somebody says, oh, so what do you do? You do pretty all right for yourself, don't you? Pretty all right for myself in terms of in terms of research. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. you talk about you know I, I work out how dinosaurs were put together and or anything mm. on land, you know, that's got to go over pretty well. Yeah, I get tired of it. I really get tired of it when I meet new people telling them about the dinosaur stuff I do because to me. It's a little bit old, uh, even though I'm still doing it. Actually, I have a pretty cool pa paper coming out soon that I'm really, really excited about. But anyway, it, it's kind of cheesy, and I'm kind of I kind of get disgusted by that side of dinosaurs. That, but at the same time, I kind of like it because I'm a geek too. So I, I, I get conflicted talking right, about so. dinosaurs. Uh, so sometimes I even like say, "Oh, I work at a vet school." So what you're trying to say is I'm an asshole. <laughs> Well, yeah, you wouldn't be the first to say that, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, uh, following up from your elephant stuff and also your uh, brief brush with fame, then uh, you worked on Inside Nature's Giants, right? Oh yeah, that was amazing. That was. I'll never forget that experience. It was just brilliant. That was in, in 2009, they filmed five episodes, the first five except for the whale one, uh, at the Royal Veterinary College. They used our giant post-mortem room and brought in an elephant in there, and then they brought in a giraffe and now a crocodile. And the guys doing that show were just so freaking good at making documentaries. Every time I told them, 
you, get, you want to get an elephant? You're crazy. You're never going to get an elephant in the next three months. And they went and they did an elephant. Uh, and uh, just really professional uh, documentary makers, th these guys from Windfall Films. And every time I talk to people who make documentaries, they're like, yep, those guys are awesome. They're really great. And uh, that, that really taught me a lot about science communication and making documentaries in particular. Just They were just so good. Uh, I'm, I'm still in awe. So I've never seen that show. So is it a show that they like gut open huge animals and show what's inside, pretty much? It's it's pretty groundbreaking, I think, in that it's a very sciencey show, packed with facts. It's just like boom, 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 all these cool facts about animals, and they're telling you that how the animal works. They show you footage of the animal in the wild, and they tell you that as they're cutting it open, and mm -hmm. and showing you the anatomy. Here is the heart of the elephant. Here is how the heart of the elephant works to pull blood through the giant body. And they combine that with CGI and really charismatic hosts who are doing some of the dissection. And uh, it's just really well done. And they're not shy about blood and gore on, on mainstream television, which that was the big step, I think, as well as just packing it full of science. Whereas you see so much like Discovery Channel or other, other shows at Animal Planet have just gone down the tubes in terms of content. It's, it's just, you know, cheesy stuff again. Uh, so it, it really it hit a, struck a nerve with the public as well as with scientists that it was just so well done. You can find some of it on YouTube still. Um, and yeah, I think, I think even if you're in America, you can find some of that. And it's been played on PBS in America, but, but uh, great show. And Richard Dawkins was on there and uh, he was doing a lot of the evolution stuff. He'd occasionally talking head, talking about, well, here is how the giraffe evolved. And it's a wonderful neck with this nerve that goes all the way down, down and does a loop around an artery and then comes back. Really stupid design. Good example of how evolution just jury rigs things. I watched my first episode today, actually, uh, in preparation for this interview. So oh, being oh. in Canada, we don't have access to, unfortunately, BBC, despite the fact that we still have them on our as a figurehead, so I, I'm bitter about that. We pay taxes. You can always come monarchy. back, come back into the fold. I know, I know. <laughs> so we might because we need the BBC is what we need. But um, mm. so I watched the crocodile one. So how long do these things take? Like I cutting up an elephant has got to take a really freaking long time. And you had a live yeah. audience sitting up in the little pit thing area yeah. for a long oh, time as well. Yeah, we had a couple hundred of our students there very avidly watching the dissections, which went on for about a day or two per animal. Um, no offense, oh, it's another. Um, I mean, we just try and cut it off and basically uh, cause the, the parts we work on most. The rest of the animal, if you're trying to get science out of it, it is a hell of a lot of work. It is grueling to try and measure everything and cut everything out carefully. Um, it's amazing to watch them. If they're just trying to get rid of it and... Uh, reduce it to a skeleton that they then can send to a museum or something. It's just like a swarm of people descend and knives flashing and boom, boom, boom. Uh, all of a sudden, after half a day, the elephant's gone. But if you're trying to do something, then you've got to slow that process down and, and you're actually racing against rot is usually the, the big problem uh, that, that we face is the measurements we take scientifically measuring every muscle and CT scanning and stuff like that. That can take a week to do a limb which uh, in the middle of summer is, is not so easy to do. Yeah. Let yeah. <laughs> alone in Africa. This is why I've never gone to, to the wild African measured wild elephants. I only get ones that die naturally in captivity, and we rush to get them. I get a call from a zoo, and they're like, hey, elephant dying uh, in an hour. We're three hours away. Can you be here in three hours? I'm like, shit, man. How do I get an elephant over to my lab? Like, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a moment of terror every time. So just real quick, so after you, you open the elephant up and you show all the pieces and they film everything, they get everything you need, what happens to the bits of it? Do you, do you keep it in the university? Well, the, the flesh goes into bins and gets incinerated. Um, the bones, if they are valuable to like a museum or something, we, we try to send them to, the, to a museum like the Edinburgh um, what's it called? I'm forgetting now. The Scottish National Museum or National Museum of Scotland? That's it. They get a lot of stuff from animals that die in zoos in the UK. 
So most of the rhinos and elephants I've dissected have gone there. Uh, but sometimes they just want to get rid of it real quick, and it, if they if they can't reach any scientists who want the bits, it all goes to the incinerator, which is is dreadfully dis depressing to me. Uh, to sometimes have to say, oh, sorry, I can't take your freshly dead giant bull hippo who died during this, during anesthesia and was perfectly healthy because there's no way I can get to it. So I've had to turn down really helpful data, really rare data from animals we know very little about occasionally just because it's inconvenient. John, you were talking about, about working on this show, Inside Nature's Giants, which I'm looking forward to seeing because I've never heard of it. But uh, this brings us to the idea of public engagement with science, which I know mm -hmm. is a big, big thing for you. And you know we Absolutely. should, we should publicly plug Bug here, who uh, mm -hmm. has just found out that she's going to be indexed <laughs> in the Library of <laughs> Library of Congress. Her her blog will become part of the everlasting record. So you know, if you're looking for pubic lice or Spider Man's taint on the web, <laughs> go find the Library of Congress. Yep. <laughs> Centuries from now, people will be going, why, <laughs> why? For science. Yeah. You'll be an anthropological <laughs> study all on your own. That's for sure. But so, so this is a, an issue of some interest to you, then, John. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, and, and all you guys too. I know. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm still learning. I mean, uh, I had kind of a baptism by fire, where uh, in 2002, as a postdoc in California, I published a paper in Nature showing that T. Rex couldn't run very fast. Luckily, I was warned by my advisors from my PhD, which that work came from, that this is going to be a media bonanza. They're going to go freaking nuts. So you better prepare and make a website that helps explain the paper and all this other stuff. And indeed, yeah, my phone started ringing and, and kind of didn't stop for two weeks, just again and again. Literally, I would put the phone down and pick it up, and there'd be another news agency or someone wanting to talk to me about it. And that really taught me how to communicate to the media, which is only part of science communication, but it's a part that I think I'm good at. There's other stuff maybe I'm not so good at. I'm still learning like blogging and, and Twitter and all this other stuff, which I've been kind of kind of new to. And, and, and now that I'm on sabbatical and I'm a professor with full tenure and pretty much nothing to worry about, I can begin to experiment and take risks and do fun <laughs> stuff. So that's what I'm trying to do is, is just think of new ways to communicate what I'm doing or what my team is doing, really. It's really, I've got a pretty big team, and it, it definitely is a team effort. And so I'm trying to learn ways to communicate science better and engage the public directly rather than, than just transmit information to them and, um, and, and communicate what we're doing and why it's important. Some of the stuff we're doing is, is very applied and very, very important and relevant. Other stuff is on the other end of the spectrum where it's just fun and cool like the dinosaur stuff, and, and people are easy to sell on that. And because it's so easy to get people interested in stuff like that, I really feel like it's my job. I have to do it. It's not just what I want to do. It's something that I feel morally I must do, is go reach out and communicate what I'm doing as a scientist because it's so easy. It would be kind of lame of me to just sit in my office and be like, ah, Oh, oh, la laughing from my ivory tower down at the hoi polloi and keeping all my science to myself. I, 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 would, I would rather share it and, and feel that I need to. I, I love that image of scientists just hoarding a big pile of science. <laughs> <laughs> my precious. <laughs> um, but but uh, <laughs> we lost Morgan. Okay. So. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Hey, you gotta have at least one Gollum reference in every uh, podcast. But the nerd cred up, yeah. Yeah. So, John, are you? Do you find some areas of your research, or you know, like that are more difficult to communicate that you struggle with? Yeah. Um, well, I'm still trying to get my head around one project I have with broiler chickens, which are the chickens that you eat if you eat chicken meat. They're usually the ones that are bred for that meat, and we breed billions and billions of them every year. And I'm still trying to get a, my head around a way to really explain that stuff because on the surface it's kind of it's kind of boring. They're ugly, disgusting animals in a way. The public might see them that way that they're you know they don't move much. They're not that pretty, um, but it's incredibly important stuff. 
that that you know there's a food crisis going on. Chicken meat is one of the most popular and environmentally friendly meats. So, but at the same time, we have an animal welfare problem with these birds that they have a high percentage, depending on who you ask, of pathology. They have problems walking, basically, and we're trying to use biomechanics to solve why do broiler chickens walk so poorly, and could we evolve by selection a healthier walking chicken? So that's my pitch. Uh, that's about as far as I've gotten. We've got a blog together that we're debuting soon, The, the Chicken of the Future. Uh, the Chicken and, of the Future. <laughs> yeah. Um, but still, I'm trying to think of ways to really get the public hooked on that, because it's a lot harder than with dinosaur stuff. But I'm used to the easy the easy sell uh, with the public. I'm not so used to pushing the harder stuff. And some of the some of the more boring stuff I do, I don't even try to in, engage with because I don't know if I'm lazy or I'm not creative enough or what. But I just I don't just don't know. And of course, there are only so many hours in the day. You can't communicate everything you do. Mm. Um, I have a question about the broiler chickens because it's not just that we bred them to have weaker bones, right? It's the problem that the cages that they're kept in. That's why a lot of people use them for models of muscular degeneration or bone degeneration. Mm. Sorry. Well, so there's broiler chickens on one hand that are usually not so much kept in cages, but in huge, huge barns, basically, with a fairly high density of animals, but open, so they can move around freely. Oh, then there's the, there then there's they the egg, Then there's the egg-laying birds that are sometimes, in some countries, kept in small cages and don't move much because they're just sitting there pumping out eggs. Uh, so they don't, they don't really want them to move around that much. But, the, I mean, laws are getting stricter and stricter on that. You don't have that kind of battery egg-laying hens in the U.K., for example. America's a bit more lenient with, with uh, animal yeah. welf welfare issues like that. Uh, I think we still keep broiler chickens in cages here. You may. Uh, but mm. the, the, the industry I've worked with doesn't do that so much. Um, but there are, I mean, there's diversity in America in particular. The yeah. laws here are so much stricter, you can't, you can't pull that off anymore in much of the UK and a large part of the EU. Yeah, I mean, speaking as the resident Aggie here, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it is more common. And, and there's these tremendous, tremendous chicken houses that are mm -hmm. just, you know, 10,000 chickens. I mean... It's just yeah. chickens as far as the eye can see. That's that's, that's a amazing. more common way. Um, the the ones that are in the cages and really have their movement restricted are the layers. Um, but but yeah, I mean the way that we do it in the U.S. and the way that it's done in the EU is totally different. So so I had a question actually, which was how did you get involved in the chicken of tomorrow? Um, ah, that actually <laughs> came from my in a way from my T Rex work that I had designed computer modeling methods that could kind of, you could build the anatomy of an animal and figure out how it might have moved. And a lot of that was focused on whether the animal was kind of front heavy or back heavy. That would influence the way it would move, where its center of mass was, is, is the physical term. And uh, some colleagues who did chicken research along with the chicken in industry partner saw that work or knew what I was doing and thought, well, hey, this stuff that John is doing on dinosaurs, which included, I did a biomechanical model of what if, what if you took a chicken and made it 6,000 kilograms, the same size as a T-Rex, and how could, it, how could it walk or stand? Well, they saw it and thought, well, you could apply those methods to a real chicken and figure out why do these chickens have these problems walking? They're kind of front heavy. They have a lot of breast muscle in front, and they, so they think they tend to tip over forwards, and that makes them move in a weird way and puts weird stresses on their bones and muscles. So that was actually the surprisingly logical connection and, and very serendipitous connection that led to me getting a PhD student that was sponsored partly by industry along with a, a, a veterinary clinician, and we worked together to try and understand how these, how these birds work and, and help industry breed healthier ones. It was really interesting for me, the first time ever working with mega, mega industry. This is one of the biggest broiler chicken breeders in the world. So uh, if we had like even a 1% impact on their mortality of their chickens, that staggering numbers of animals saved every year and staggering amounts of money for them. 
and good PR because they get a lot of crap from people saying, you know, you're not treating your chickens well, do better. And they say, yeah, we want to do better because we're losing money. How do we do better? Well, that's, that's the conundrum. So I wanted to just go back to what you were saying a minute ago about um, being used to the, the easy sell for your work. And I was just wondering if that's what you find for your blog, What's in John's Freezer? And I don't, I think it's amazing, but then I don't know whether Thank it's you. an easy sell for someone like me because I'm a nerd who does biology. So if there's a guy who's like, I've got a giraffe leg in my freezer, let's have a look <laughs> at it. <laughs> then that's easy for me to get excited about. <laughs> I just wanted to, to share what I had. I, I knew it would be a niche thing, and it still is, that, that it, you know, I've got less than 100 followers, and I've got a lot of views from like Reddit occasionally stumbling across an image of an elephant with its guts spilling out, and people being like, whoa, that's amazing. Uh, but to me, it was always to share my passion for anatomy, because I just think anatomy is, is awesome, and we're in the middle of a renaissance for anatomical studies. And I think also uh, the, my experience with Inside Nature's Giants really showed me how much the public wants to hear about this. They want to see dead animals or any animals and they understand how, yeah. how they work. They want to see anatomy, real anatomy. They don't want to see all this cartoonish stuff that, that's kind of uh, you know, spoon-fed to them. Some people want to see that. So not everybody. Some people are grossed out. A lot of people are grossed out. But and I knew that. But still, I knew there was enough of general interest that, especially among people like me, but also the broader public, that, that it probably had a chance of, of being a satisfying experience for blogging, and, and that has turned out to be true over the last year. I really, really love doing it. It's been an eye-opening experience for me to try blogging. I had said for years, oh, I'll never blog, I'll never tweet, all that social media stuff for research, and it's just not me. Uh, maybe it's ephemeral, but then I gradually proved myself wrong just watching other people do it. Um, so I know you study, obviously, like biomechanics has led you to be able to study all these cool animals. Is there something that is sort of like your dream subject that you're always trying to come up with a project to be able to work with it? That's a great question. I, mean, I, I, I try to discipline myself because I look at things like uh, cephalopods or or mantis shrimp, or just all these other cool animals that are not vertebrates, and I think, ooh, ooh, I'd like to look at those. That would be cool to study. But then I'm like, John, you can't do everything. You've got maybe a couple decades left in your career. Let's let's get the guys done that you know best. So, I mean, I really want to work more with, with rhinos. I'd love to work with hippos. And uh, My expertise is in the really big animals and giant size in land animals, so that's where I am headed, although the hippos, I haven't really got to much yet. I'm trying to think what else. Well, Komodo, Komodo dragon. Yeah, I mean, that's huge on my list and, and very difficult to access. So I would love to do one of them. So I think, uh, I think uh, Stephen is prodding us. So we've got some, some live viewers and, and uh, want to thank them and acknowledge them. So uh, just wanted to point out that Kai thanks for doing an awesome job this week, and uh, we wanted to thank Kai. And if anybody's listening at home later, you can always watch us live and listen live and ask questions of the guests, and we'd love to have uh, some outside commentary. So you, too, could be famous on YouTube through here. <laughs> for our 10 viewers. Yeah, I, I, this breaks my heart to, to call a halt to this because we're out of time, but because you do some pretty awesome stuff. And I, I really don't think we've beaten dinosaurs to death yet. And they're already dead, but, Stephen. Yeah, they're Damn dead. It. Yeah, they're dead. It's done. Wait, oh, no, did... they're birds. All right. Well, that's a good place to end it. So we want to thank John for joining us on this episode. And, thank uh, you, guys. That was really fun. Yeah. No, and I, I'd love to actually have you back because I think there's so much we didn't touch on. And we yeah, can chat again true. sometime. Yeah. <laughs> definitely anytime. Yeah, I would, I would definitely do it again. All right. So if you want to learn more, we're at breakingbio.com. And uh, so thanks for joining us for episode 22, and we'll see you guys next time. See you. Thanks, John. Bye. Thanks, John.